body. And uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for this uh, uh, nice venue that they chose and for making this event possible. Uh, I'm very happy to give this talk and uh, interact with people here and uh, be present here. So what I will uh, discuss about uh, are our uh, results on how to simulate non-hermitian systems on superconducting quantum processors. And uh, the people responsible for this work are the following. Shruti Dogra is a, is a postdoc in my group. Uh, um, Artem Melnikov has been a visitor in my group some time ago when this work was done. And Felix Kivela is a starting PhD student in my group. He is responsible for the newest results, which I might not sure that I will have time to show. So what uh, I will uh, present is a uh, Perhaps a different thing that you, many people here do, which uh, is typically standard Hermitian quantum physics, I will try to convince you that there is something beyond that, something which is non-Hermitian and still works. So let me just, uh, before uh, going into the topic, let me tell you that uh, in spite of what you will see in this talk, most of our activity, in fact, in our group is experimental related to superconducting qubits and their applications. Um, we do a lot of analog simulations like trying to simulate uh, uh, gauge potentials like in this work here. We do sensing with superconducting qubits. We do work a lot on parametric devices nowadays, um, meaning that we take uh, parametric amplifiers and try to create highly entangled state in the in continuous variables, like this shows uh, cluster state with uh, four variables. Uh, we work on various uh, ideas related to machine learning, how to implement uh, machine learning in conjunction with superconducting qubits and circuits. And this is one review paper that we wrote about the applications of machine learning in sensing, in quantum sensing. We uh, do a lot of exotic stuff as well. For instance, this interaction-free measurements, that, which is a, a very interesting topic that we managed to, that, to show recently that it really does work in uh, an experiment. And a uh, number of things related to general quantum information and theoretical studies and uh, algorithms, uh, pretty much in the style that you will see now. Okay, so um, the plan of my talk is the following. I will first present some very general introduction in what is this non-Hermitian quantum mechanics and what does it actually mean, how does it work. I will show you what it is PT symmetry, what does it mean that it's a broken PT symmetry, what are the exceptional points, uh, and then I will go into the topic itself into what we did into our results. So I will say a few words about quantum simulation of non-Hermitian qubits, how it's done, and show how we have demonstrated this PT symmetry and its violation in uh, an experiment done on a superconducting, or several superconducting processors. And then some little paradoxes that come uh, out, uh, namely that apparently is a non-preservation of distance measures in, uh, in, uh, in this type of uh, quantum physics and uh, also a property called entanglement, entanglement monotonicity is, uh, seems uh, apparently violated. And then conclude, and perhaps I will have time to show you some of our newest results. So what is uh, the topic that I'm going to, going to discuss? I want first to tell you that it's something real. It's not some uh, totally mathematical invented uh, formalis that perhaps has no, uh, no uh, bearing on reality, but it, it is something that people have encountered in the study of systems that have both dissipation and gain. So here's a kind of typical thing that you uh, might encounter in various types of um, experiments in uh, optics, for instance. Typically, you have two modes that are coupled by some constant mu here, and then the modes are at some frequency omega 1 and omega 2, and they have dissipation gamma 1 and gamma 2. Now, this dissipation can also be gain if I change the sign, if one of these things is negative. Th then it, it comes as a gain. 
So uh, it's uh, somehow very ubiquitous system because yeah, we what else um, more than this we uh, might encounter. We have two modes, two couple modes. There is gain, there is dissipation. Um, these things can be found, for instance, in uh, laser physics. You have uh, two lasers uh, that are pumped here and uh, they are coupled. Then you have mechanical system where there is some kind of optical mode coupled to the mechanical mode. Um, then we have uh, whispering mode galleries where one of the modes, uh, one of the wave travels in one direction, the other in the other direction, and they're also coupled. And then we have all kinds of metamaterials that we can do at microwaves with this type of, uh, uh, of uh, structures on uh, design on a, a silicon chip. Now, what is the interesting thing and how to, we can formulate the problem? Of course, the problem of systems that have loss, we know we can use a lean blood equation. Also with gain, there is the formalism of uh, parametric amplifiers and so on. They can be formulated separately in several ways. But something interesting happens when uh, there is uh, uh, gain in the system, there is loss in the system, but the gain equals exactly the loss. So uh, you put stuff in these boxes. You can imagine that you put water here. Uh, there's something that communicates the water. You extract the water from these boxes, but the amount that you put is exactly the same as the amount that you extract. This means that you can still uh, have some conservation of probabilities here. I mean, the uh, probabilities will be still uh, uh, conserved and well-defined. And that brings up the idea that perhaps you, you can use still the Hamiltonian formalist rather than using the dissipation of, let's say, lean blood form and, and so on. So this is like a very general uh, idea related to uh, the loss and gain that, that allows us to proceed by, by uh, employing a Hamiltonian formalism. And then how about symmetry? Why do we need to have symmetry? So if we look at these two boxes, uh, we will talk a lot about PT symmetry, which is uh, symmetry under parity and time reversal. So what does it mean parity here? Parity means simply that we exchange these two boxes, one with the other. And time reversal means that we exchange gain and loss here. So we simply loss become gains, loss becomes gain, and, and the gain becomes loss. So the simply the uh, errors in uh, these figures would be reversed. And you can see that if I do these two operations, so if I do the time reversal, meaning reversal of the errors uh, of this, uh, uh, gain and loss, and if I switch the two boxes, this figure will be exactly the same. So that's a very direct visual uh, interpretation or visualization of, uh, of a PT symmetry in what I will present next. All right, so who has come up with this idea? Uh, there were these two people who are mathematical physicists and they wrote a paper in 1998 called Via Spectra in Non-Hermitian Hamiltonians Having PT Symmetry, in which they made this very big uh, uh, claim that, okay, we teach quantum physics, we teach in quantum physics that Hamiltonians have to be Hermitians, and Hermitians, and observable have to be Hermitians, and so on and so on, and it's not true. It doesn't necessarily have to be so. I mean, it's nice if you have them, but it's not necessarily the case that it has to be so. And they showed that indeed for a system having PT symmetry, you can have Hamiltonians that are non-Hermitian, but the, um, you can still uh, work very nicely with them because the eigenvalues are still going to be real. And they give some uh, very concrete and uh, simple examples in um, uh, continuous variables in X and P, how to construct this kind of Hamiltonians, which we will not do. We will focus on the qubits. But generally, yeah, in standard Hermitian quantum mechanics, we have observables that are Hermitian operators. Then we generate by using this Hermitian operator's uh, dynamics, which is unitary. And we have uh, eigenvalue spectrum uh, that consists of uh, real values, meaning that these things are real. They are numbers that we can go and measure uh, in the lab. Um, so, 
again, this is not generally true that it's, uh, we don't have to, to be so strict and impose this restriction. And indeed, what uh, turns out to be the case is that if this relation, so the Hamiltonian, if the Hamiltonian commutes with these PT operators that can be defined uh, mathematically very rigorously, in a very rigorous way, then also the eigenvalues are going to be real of this type of Hamiltonians. And the system that we will discuss next is a single qubit for which we simply have that disparity operator is the sigma x operator, and t, which is the time symmetry, is just complex con conjugation. And let me show you how exactly what is the structure that we get here mathematically. So the Hamiltonian that can be written and uh, people consider as a paradigmatic form of uh, this non-Hermitian Hamiltonians is this one. So sigma x plus i r sigma z. And you can clearly see that it's, uh, it's non-Hermitian uh, unless r equals zero due to the existence of this parameter r, which is a real parameter. Now, it's extremely simple to go to any, either do it uh, yourself on a piece of paper or go to Mathematica and diagonalize this kind of Hamiltonian, of course, because it's a two by two matrix. And we can find very easily what are the, the essential, uh, what's the essential structure. So there is a region, first of all, if r equals zero, as I said, uh, this is trivial, it's just uh, x poly operator and so on. But uh, if r is not uh, equal to zero, then we have the region in which of parameters of r in which we have PT symmetry where the eigenvalues are real and they can be calculated. So the eigenvalues are this uh, psi plus or minus. They have this kind of structure that can be obtained immediately. And then what happens is that at r equals uh, one, the eigenvalues become zero and the eigenvector becomes uh, uh, this one here. A very simple thing just with i and one. And next we can go to the region of broken PT symmetry where r is larger than one. And in that case we have imaginary eigenvalues so, uh, and these eigenvectors can be still calculated like this but the eigenvalues are imaginary and they do not correspond anymore to some real observables. On the block sphere, we can see these three regions very uh, nicely because the block sphere representation can still be used. So we, again, we have these Hamiltonians and we um, start by uh, uh, at r equals zero. At r equals zero, we have these two points here. And then as we move, as r increases, we reach this point which corresponds to r equals one. And then we break into these two branches that corresponds to R larger than one. So these are, these are what, the, the eigenstates? Yes, yeah. On, on the block sphere representation, exactly like you would do for a qubit, we also have a qubit, but uh, these are the eigenstates of a non-Hermitian operator. And from here you cannot... Yeah, uh, at, it's, at it's this... Yes, exactly. You don't know at this point, but you see that something happened, something interesting happened, namely the, the, this eigenvalues coalesce here yeah. at, uh, at one point and then something else happens. They break apart into two. So the PT symmetric means, is it symmetric under T and T or just by the product? By the product, by their product. Can you just explain why this Hamiltonian is PT symmetric? Uh, sorry, I'm wrongly oh, I'm switching. Uh, yeah, you. But T is the complex conjugate, so it. Uh, yeah, but it would it, it changes the sign on the minus i in front at the, in the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> so. Yes.
uh, if you just calculate the eigenvalues, you will see that it's ah, because it, 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 but the symmetry is the same. This is symmetry. right. It is symmetric for any value of r if it's real. Mm. Yeah, I don't have a good fast uh, intuitive answer. <laughs> So, but you will see what happens when we uh, when we uh, go on the on this uh, type of representation, namely that uh, we uh, now look at the evolution of the system, and uh, if this is time and this is the value of the R parameter, then we see here that there are oscillations occurring in in this region, and for R equals one, then we. Uh, just don't have these oscillations anymore. There is some kind of decaying uh, that, that occurs here. And so we can uh, calculate this thing again uh, analytically, and the, the result of this thing comes out, um, yeah, it can be calculated very easily like this. And then the evolution can also be calculated, so the state zero goes to alpha zero t to zero plus beta zero to one and so on, and these uh, normalized pop populations can be calculated uh, as well. And so um, the uh, picture uh, that we, we get here is that these oscillations that we normally see in, uh, in uh, Hamiltonian with, uh, when we put, uh, uh, we try to drive Rabi oscillations will exist for R equal zero, but they will collapse for uh, R equal one, which marks the transition to uh, this uh, broken symmetry state for R larger than one. Um, right. And what I will uh, show you is now something that I really cannot explain intuitively because it gets uh, pretty complicated. It's a formalism in which we are trying to reproduce the dynamics of this um, uh, of this non-Hermitian evolution by the following uh, by the following construction, namely we will separate our qubit into the qubit itself and an ancilla, and then we will see what happens when we project on the states of the ancilla itself. So the aim is to reproduce this type of evolution here. So I d by dt psi of t equals h q psi of t, where this h q is the non-Hermitian evolution. And, um, and uh, what the, the way in which we, const we have this construction is that we, uh, have a, we, we do a Neimark dilation, meaning that we expand the space from the qubit itself to the ancilla in, in this kind of uh, way, and then the we have a dynamics which is under this Schrodinger equation, i d by dt psi of t a q and so on, yeah? So we want to solve this big equation in the space of the, uh, the two uh, qubit plus ancilla. And in the end, what we will do is that we will look at the solutions only when we project on the ancilla uh, space, which is zero. So we want that this um, evolution on the subspace where the ancilla is zero uh, is exactly the evolution given by this uh, non-Hermitian. Uh, so, so essentially, it's like a post-selection. We are post. Exactly, we are doing post-selection on the values of the ancilla. Okay. So we are running this experiment and then and do tomography and then post-selection. So. Um, we, uh, we have the following results then. So um, the way in which we do this, uh, this operation is as follows. So we have an initialization stage where we start with the state zero on the ancilla and zero on the qubit. We have to rotate this ancilla with uh, an operator ry with the rotation on, uh, over phase theta. And uh, we do the evolution in the extended space, and then we measure these probabilities. How we construct this evolution, we have to find uh, uh, the composition of the gates that reproduces exactly the total unitary evolution on the two qubit subspace that we want to find out. 
And this we do it numerically. It's not easy to find it, but we follow some procedure that allows us to extract these uh, gates that can be implemented on the on a IBM quantum computer, for instance. And what we see here exactly is exactly the behavior that I uh, mentioned before. So we see Rabi oscillations here, or kind of Rabi oscillations for the case when uh, R is smaller than one. Uh, we see that there is a phase transition here, meaning that this uh, Rabi oscillation transforms into a decay for R equals one, which is the exceptional point. And for R equals 1.3, we see that there is an even more abrupt uh, decay which corresponds to this uh, phase where the eigenvalues are not real anymore. In the non-Hermitian part is the evolution that is uh, imprinted on this qubit under post-selection on, on the ancilla. So we evolve the entire system and then we do post-selection on the ancilla. We select only the results in which ancilla is on the ground state and the resulting evolution that we obtain for the remaining uh, qubit corresponds exactly to this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. All right. Okay, one of the curious things about this uh, story is that we have, um, in quantum physics, we uh, have several results related to the distinguishability of uh, quantum states. And these are quantified in terms of the distance between two quantum states. So when we have the trace distance, we can define the trace distance uh, between these two quantum states as by, by this formula, trace of rho differential dagger rho differential. Yeah. And uh, where this uh, different differential is the difference between these two states, so this is a, one of the definitions that allows us to really study the, how, how these states are uh, evolving in time. And in standard quantum physics, we have this relation. Ba basically, the Hamiltonian would be Hermitian. And these uh, distances between states are preserved. It can be known that it is the case that they are preserved like this. And it turns out that for our system, which is uh, non-Hermitian, this uh, result is no longer valid. And so we did experiments where we uh, looked at exactly this distance, and we see that for the case uh, of, uh, of the PT symmetry uh, where R is uh, smaller than one, um, these um, oscillations, uh, they, they, the system oscillates like this. When R equals one, there is this decay, and when R equals 1.3, there is even a sharper decay like this. And this can be reproduced also numerically by looking directly at the single qubit non-Hermitian uh, Hamiltonian and evolving it in, in time domain for different values of time. And you see that this corresponds to different cuts in this uh, uh, region. Um, and you can define based on, on uh, this oscillation a recurrence time, which is like this, that uh, can be calculated uh, um, analytically. It's pi divided by one of square root of uh, one minus R2. And these are, the dots are our experimental results and the line is the, just simply the plot of this quantity here. We can define also decay time tau, which is, uh, also can be calculated like this. And uh, you can see that they, it corresponds pretty well with what we uh, find uh, experimentally. And then from this uh, uh, plot here, which is at r equals one, we can uh, find the critical exponent of this transition because it's like a phase transition, even if it's not a large number of particles, but it's like a phase transition. Um, with a critical exponent delta. And this delta theoretically should be two. And what we find exper 
experimentally is 1.75 uh, plus minus something. So it's pretty close and uh, so it works pretty nicely in the experiment. The second curious thing that I want to bring up is the monotonicity of entanglement. Um, this can be also uh, quantified in, uh, in our experiments by uh, introducing the concurrence as by, by this measure. So the concurrence of, the, of two qubits Q and Q prime. Uh, it's a standard, I would say, uh, definition that we are using in, in terms of these eigenvalues of this operator, uh, which is defined like this. So we can uh, we can um, uh, we can uh, measure and uh, calculate this concurrence, and let's see what happens. So uh, first of all, we we are doing this experiment now in a bit uh, different way having an ANSI line two qubits, because we want to see what happens with two qubits of which one undergoes this non-Hermitian uh, evolution. Uh, and the other one doesn't do anything. So the qubit Q is, uh, undergoes this uh, non-Hermitian evolution here. This qubit Q, Q prime doesn't, is left alone here. Then, except that it's prepared here, we can prepare it also, we can prepare this Q and Q prime in an entangled state, as you can see here with a Hadamard and the C naught. But here it's, uh, it's left alone. So we see pretty much the same phenomenon. At uh, smaller values of R, of this parameter R, there is this oscillation here. At R equals one, it's, this oscillation transforms into a decay and at R equals 1.3, there is an even uh, more uh, pronounced decay. And also, if we look at the concurrence here and we, uh, we look how it decays uh, in time, we can find again this kind of decay law, which allows us to extract a critical experimental critical exponent this time of 1.93, quite close to the value, theoretical value of 2. Okay, we also studied here a lot, a lot of other uh, quantities that calculate uh, the tripartite entanglement between these two qubits and they all behave uh, pretty much uh, as uh, they should uh, according to the theory. Um, and we also did experiments where we initially uh, prepared the state in a certain arbitrary state, uh, entangled state with some uh, concurrence of 0 0.4 and then study how it evolves under different uh, values of R. So you see that we can increase, even increase the concurrence for R equals 0 0.3. We start with a small concurrence and then we increase it here as time goes by. Okay, so in summary, we, uh, uh, we uh, studied uh, different type of system related to non-Hermitian Hamiltonians. We uh, see a, a demonstration of PT symmetry breaking in a si single qubit Rabi oscillations that are used as a signature for this transition. And then we see that in non-Hermitian quantum physics, arbitrary quantum states can be distinguished. Um, we, can make, we can, for instance, make them orthogonal, which is not possible in uh, standard quantum physics. And we have demonstrated this on uh, several, um, in several experiments on the IBM, uh, uh, several processes of the IBM quantum experience. And that's pretty much it to end up. I would say that we, if anybody wants to work with us, we have several postdoc positions now open in the group. Please feel free to contact me and I can take questions if there are any.